Hello and welcome back to my channel on a Sunday afternoon in the garden when it's actually really sunny and nice and quite noisy with birds. I hope you can um, hear me okay because I'm not using microphones and stuff anymore. I hope this <laughs> is um, powerful enough to pick up my chatter in the garden. I'm on with this, the second Travis Baldry book, Bookshops and Bone Dust. And it's a nice reminder of, um, of the first book, Legends and Lattes, which I read last year, which lots of people read last year. I remember um, a kind of cosy epic fantasy is the genre. And this is 20 years before the first book. And it's about the bookshop and Viv, the orc, who's injured herself and she has to um, recover and get to know um, the bookseller down, down the road from the place where she's recuperating. And she's a very terse and uh, gruff kind of orc, but she's drawn in by people's friendliness. And, and she also starts reading and eating cakes and things made by a baker living on the same street. What this has in common with the first one um, apart from all of its themes and, and its main character, is uh, a lovely atmosphere, I think. It's a very densely woven atmosphere. I think he writes well. It's quite old-fashioned in a way, I mean, aside from it being epic fantasy. It feels like the kind of book you'd buy um, in a Del Rey paperback in the early 90s, that kind of book, where they used to blend genres all the time thinking of things like The Party Coloured Unicorn by John de Clay, or The Land of Laughs by um, Jonathan Carroll. My favourite books of that kind of era. Anyway, I thought I'd um, take this opportunity to go through some of these questions. And this leads straight in from Travis Baldry, actually, because one of the questions that I got the other day when I asked for them from everyone was um, somebody saying, I noticed you read a lot of non-mainstream books, and I'm curious if you avoid mainstream, quotes, popular novels, or do you just enjoy other types of books more? Um, I just read what occurs to me, really, what I fancy reading. I acquire books all over the place, all the time, lots of them secondhand, in charity shops and junk shops, uh, and also things like eBay. Um, uh, as I go scouting out things that I've remembered or remembered I wanted to read. I actually don't go into newer bookshops much anymore. And I know what you mean, <laughs> the person asking the question, about non-mainstream books and, quotes, popular novels. It's about falling for the hype, isn't it? And I think I've read enough stuff over enough years to have fallen for the hype in the past, um, especially with things that are being talked about, things that are very popular at the moment. <laughs> that can be quite disappointing. And also I don't feel the need to keep up with what everybody else is reading, things that everybody's talking about. Um, the kind of, and certainly not the kind of book talk stuff that goes on. I, um, I watch lots of YouTube videos and you do notice the same people or people reading the same books at the same time. I don't feel the need. <laughs> Sometimes things leap out of that, like Travis Baldry, actually. There was lots of talk about this, um, but it seemed different enough to intrigue me. Um, I just follow my own path. I zigzag, as I said. That's the word. I zigzag around the things I want to read. I do have a to-be-read mountain, of course, which I've included, I've shown in, in some videos in the past. I think people are horrified at how many books I've got still to read. But we'll see. Other questions, let's see. Uh, you may have explained this before and I missed it, but how do you decide on when a video uploads? I've noticed them going up at 9am-ish, but lately it's been around midnight, as far as I can tell. Hope this isn't a dull question. Um, it used to be 9am-ish, and then I made a mistake when I forgot to set the, <laughs> the time on the schedule thing and it just popped up at midnight. And I thought, well, why don't I just leave it at midnight and, and um, allow people to watch a new thing through the night so that by the morning there's already 
a few people who've seen it. So I just I just leave it as it is now. I put on today's tomorrow's date and leave it at midnight. So it's a very prosaic answer, but it's an interesting <clears throat> thing to decide. And um, I don't know when these things are best done. Really, it's been odd doing them every day because you have to have a time that you make them available. You can't just do them all at once. So midnight seems a good time to me. I like things suddenly appearing. I also think as well that from my point of view, if I was watching these or something like it, and it was something I kind of regularly tuned in for, I like the idea of, because I'm such an insomniac, getting up in the middle of the night and there being something new, some new message from somebody I listen to. It's like a, a message in a bottle in the middle of the night. I quite like that idea. Uh, which of your characters or books reflect your interest in class? I suppose that refers to my own characters, my own books. And I think they all do. I think I write about it all the time in one way or another, about people fitting in or not fitting in, or the codes of acceptance or snobbery or um, breaking through barriers. All those are kind of big themes in what, what I do. And I think the fiction I like is about. But I think um, one of my repeated tropes, although I hate that word, is the idea of taking a genre which has been one thing and turning it into something else by putting in the middle of it the voice of a working class female character. So in um, the Brenda and Effie series, the Bride of Frankenstein, Brenda and the Rates, and she sounds like... Um, she sounds like she sounds. She sounds like a, a, a northern working class woman, really. And so does Iris Wildtime in the middle of um, time travel adventures. And so you see those, those kind of genres all new again through the eyes of somebody who's not used to being in the middle, who would just be secondary characters um, in the past. So I think I'd do that by my interest in class and everything comes out through turning, hopefully turning genres on their heads a bit. Let's see, what's this one? This one. Uh, <laughs> just came across your, this is Molly, this is Molly. Just came across your wonderful videos by accident. Thank you. And I love them. I love your stories, views and opinions and how honest you are about the reality of writing. I've always written, mainly for myself, articles, journals, poems and stories, anything that caught my attention or imagination. I never write with the intention of anyone else ever reading it. And on the only occasion I was persuaded to read some of it aloud, I was told by a very snobby woman that I should stick to my little day job and leave writing to real writers. I remember being mortified and escaped as soon as I could, went home and lay on the bed and cried. But once the tears had dried, I suddenly thought, well, feck you, you rude, ignorant witch. Then the cat shared some ice cream with me and suddenly the world was okay again. That's a great message. <clears throat> Cats and ice cream are sometimes the panacea to life's trials and tribulations. It's true. Um, gatekeepers, that's what that's about. People set themselves up to be gatekeepers in the arts, all kinds of arts, in every area of life, I think. It makes them feel powerful and much more interesting <laughs> and qualified than they are, but it's all a lot of bollocks. People get themselves into these positions. Um, I've thought about this a lot recently. There's something around here where I live that should be a community centre that's been um, uh, used by a number of people. And um, it's, <laughs> I can't even tell this story without laughing or, um, anyway, it, somebody who works there is a bit of a gatekeeper and there's a few of them around here. And I got some comments when I first started putting my paintings of Levensheim online a few snooty comments about, you know, um, these would look better with a more muted palette. <laughs> and it was, it was so high-handed ha high and so patronising. Um, and I just love the idea that somebody's telling you to be less colourful in order to fit in. And that's often the way. I've had that, I guess, a number of times over the year from people. 
going right back to my junior school teacher, Mrs. Nellist, who um, told me how I had to learn to fit in more with the other boys, and I've despised anybody telling me stuff like that ever since. In the world of writing, I've had it all the time. No, you're not doing this quite right. Going back to that fellow when I started teaching at UEA, a fellow who was just a student, but he was a favourite of the other members of the faculty, and he took me aside at a party and said, it won't do, you know, the kind of thing you write. It won't do for here. And then when I did publish the Brenda and Effie books, the first one, we had a party, and in a nice venue, it was a museum, a hospital museum in London, and we invited various people, and the great and the good, and then people from the horror uh, genre, and somebody whose work I really liked, an anthologist. And over the buffet, he took me aside and um, said, oh, well, this, you know, your book is just shallow pastiche, really. It's not real. It's not real horror. It'll never fit in. It'll do nothing. I, was, I thought he was going to say something nice, but it's interesting, these people who take you aside, and usually it's when nobody else can hear, and they tell you, you won't do. And they're gatekeepers. They're just there to um, monitor and control who gets in to do the things that they want to do. And they'll only let in the people they want. And they're not qualified to do that usually. They're just bullies usually. They've elbowed their way forward and they want to control who gets to do the thing. And it's not only down to them. <clears throat> it's not just in their gift. I've seen a lot of this, so never listen to them. And if you want to write, just write. Oops, I'm trying to find the rest of these questions. Okay, this question from Brisbane, Australia. I'm only a very new subscriber, and I fear that some of the questions I might have at this point involve things you've already covered in previous videos, but I'll think of some. It's all right, I can repeat myself. I'm quite happy talking. Uh, in the meantime, I wonder if you like Jeanette Winderson's work. She grew up in Manchester, particularly her earlier works, written in the 80s and 90s. One of my favourite books is her essay collection, Art Objects. Uh, it's nice seeing a YouTuber with book content who is older than, let's say, the majority. I feel like most booktubers are in their early 20s, perhaps because of having more ease around social media, being on camera and having more time. I've also seen a fair few booktubers older than me. I don't know how old this person is. Uh, but not many in my age group, particularly those whose content I enjoy. It's my birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, 18th of May. And I turn 45. Right. There are definitely books that I read in my early 20s that I've reread in my mid-40s, and life experience has learnt that reading, a reading experience has a whole extra layer. There's cats. There's cats in the bushes. Uh... I'm sure that will evolve again in another 20 years. I've talked about that before, how books grow and change as we do. And when we go back to them, the characters seem different. I had that reaction with novels like um, Margaret Atwood's Cat's Eye or the original Tales of the City by Armistead Maupin. Both those books I read in my early 20s when I was younger than the characters. And then when I went back to those books 20 years later, I was older than them and felt more impatient, shall we say, with the characters and their early 20s struggles, which is funny. Jeanette Winderson I've read almost everything by um, as they came out. I first read her in about 89, and I loved all those earlier books when I was a PhD student. She figures in my PhD um, uh, thesis that I wrote in the mid-90s as a kind of counterpoint to Angela Carter, as somebody else who was writing fantasy, um, and fantasy with, about, it's about gender and sexuality and so on. She works on similar ideas. I loved Sex in the Cherry and I loved Oranges and Not the Only Fruit and The Passion. And I kept on reading them all until, I think, the early 2000s. I got so far, I read one that was based on The Tempest that I thought was terrible. I think, this might be unfair, I don't know, I think she's a bit like some writers I know where they get overpraised and they can't do any wrong. And she did used to get on the telly and wag her finger at us and tell us what, what we should be thinking and she knew the answer to everything. She, I remember her 
coming on one late night show saying she was a reincarnation of Virginia Woolf or some such. Or she was the figure that Virginia Woolf anticipated arriving, the genderless writer of the future. So she might, she might have got carried away with her own hype. Because that does happen to people when they, they get everything. <laughs> everything they feel they deserve and they get praised all the time and I think she's gone a bit like that. I think I, I kind of I stopped enjoying her books so much with probably the power book. She started undercooking the fiction. It was more like reading a series of lectures, I felt. She kind of bangs you on the head a bit. Uh, more questions? Cinema Dave. Thanks so much for your videos. Keep going. I will. I do like the videos where you recommend books. Maybe you've answered this question before, but do you have a starting point for watching Doctor Who or any favourite seasons of the show that you recommend? I've watched some of the earlier show seasons with Tom Baker. Also, who are your top five authors? Tough question, I know. To me, there's a great community here on YouTube. I have a small YouTube channel that focuses on movies, physical media, books, and have found that most people are very kind, positive, and supportive, which is true. I'm surprised by all of that, given that other forms of social media can be so um, horrid. <laughs> Twitter is really awful. It's like being on the motorway and everyone's shouting out the windows of their cars at the top of their voices and going as fast as they can. This seems quite civilised, I think, or the bits of YouTube that I've seen. Now, Doctor Who, I had... Oh, all of it, all of it's lovely to watch. I would... Um, a starting point. I'd actually begin with the beginning of, of either Tom Baker or John Pertwee, I think. A lovely place to start is with the beginning of Tom Baker. 1975, that's when I began watching it. That's the kind of heart of it for me him taking Sarah and Harry off into time and space in 1975 and the great beauty of it is is that you can begin there and double back and do the earlier ones there's just lots of it and that's nice um, there are lots of little lists and things of, of you know recommends and a nice thing I like doing is watching one episode or story per doctor and filling a whole night like that Maybe even picking them at, at random. There are names of writers to look for, to look out for with Doctor Who. So I would say anything written by um, Robert Holmes or Malcolm Hulk, especially, I would watch out for and always watch those first. Uh, top five authors, I really don't know. They change all the time. Anne Tyler's always at the top. The uh, Baltimore novelist who's who I've read everything by, and I've read her for about 30 years. Family novels, really. Um, generational sagas. Who else? I'll have to think of that more. I could say that the people who've stayed with me for years, like Alan Bennett or Christopher Isherwood or Angela Carter or Salinger, J.D. Salinger. Um... But I don't know if I had to pick five that, that mean that today. I'd say Helen Hanf, who wrote 64 Charing Cross Road, and I've read everything by that she wrote. All non-fiction, all either letters or essays about New York and reading. Um, so I'd have to put her in the list today. I just reread her book, Letters from New York, um, after Christmas. And I think the test over years is which writers do you return to and can still read after years and years? Which kind of readdresses that question I said at the beginning about, you know, not reading the hyped flashes in the pan and everybody else is chasing and chasing the novelty of the new. In some ways, the important thing about reading is finding, finding the books that are going to last your lifetime and mean something to you. Uh, something else, perhaps, but still mean something in, in 10 or 20 years. These are companions. They're not just one-night stands. <laughs> Maybe one more question. Uh, is there a genre of writing you have yet to attempt 
that you would like to explore if given time, if given time, thank you. I should write a play, that's what I should do. I've never written a full length play. I've written sketches and one act things, but I've never written a full length play um, or a full length screenplay. I've had nothing filmed, which given my love for writing dialogue um, is kind of surprising. I'd love to see a screenplay made. Um, any genre, any genre, but that's the form I would like to work in. So, <laughs> um, every year, hopefully, you get to do something new, you get to learn a new set of skills, and I try and keep to that. And this year, for me, um, uh, doing my art prints as I was doing them and having a art store and selling things like that is one thing, but also, this to me is an art form as well, this whole YouTube thing and learning to talk to an audience that you can't see and to chat. So that's my new form for this year, a kind of um, extemporising, um, uh, whatever the hell it is I'm doing, holding forth, going on, bookish talk. Uh, what else? There's some lovely comments, thank you, <laughs> about my um, soothing, <laughs> soothing voice and presence. Says so someone there. Um, and also people liking the fact that um, I bring in episodes from my life in the middle of talking about other people's books. These things kind of are all interwoven for me and you pull one thread and the whole story comes spilling out because whenever I think of books I've read or writers, it always hooks back into my real life somehow. I remember where I was when I read things or who was around or what that time was all about. Uh, one more, I'm gonna run out of time. Uh, wow. If you were only able to write for one genre, which one would you choose? That's interesting, because I was talking about how I've tried out lots of different genres in prose fiction. I think if I could only do one, I would just do life writing. I would write the, the book of kind of memoirish essays that I really want to write. That I've, I guess I've written again and again. I think it's all there in different pieces. Um, but I'd like to pull that together, I think. If I got just one more chance to do a book, that's what it would have to be. I think. Because to me, that's the kind of the thing that underlies all the rest. The rest is just that in disguise. There's still loads of questions. <laughs> I must stop because I don't want to make this too long. Oops. I'm going to go back to reading this and I'm going to make a cup of tea and sit in the last of the sun. Anyway, I hope everyone's well and uh, more questions and more comments below, thanks, and likes and subscribes and all that stuff. And I will talk to you again soon in the next episode. Goodbye.